I am Jerry Klenkowitz, but who you're most interested in seeing are our two speakers. The first is uh, Mr. Sanjay Jani, an architect who was born in Mumbai and began his architectural uh, education in India. Uh, he completed it over on this side of the earth at the University of uh, Michigan, Ann Arbor. And uh, in the process of his uh, initial travels in the United States in San Luis Obispo, California, met a young woman, uh, Jigna Johnny, who uh, is his wife and who is also an architect and a member of the uh, uh, firm that uh, they share in Iowa City. Uh, the firm's name is Akar uh, Architecture and Design. Uh, was formed in uh, uh, 1997 and flourishes today. You will see some examples of Akar work, which uh, I had a preview of, and I guarantee you, you will be impressed. So I guarantee you a very good uh, talk this afternoon from uh, Mr. Sanjay Jani. I guess uh, good to be in Quasquit, and if it was good for Frank Wright, it's good for me, I guess. Um, uh, I came to the house, I guess. I don't have a clear recollection, but it was a fall day. Must be 20 years ago, or it could be 22 years ago when I came to Quasquit. And, and I was surprised that in a small town like Quasquit, and we have a house of this giant. And uh, it is a cool house. It's not the biggest, it's, but that's great because uh, budget wasn't great, but the creativity sings in every corner of this house. Uh, but the one thing I still remember or while I was going through images, finding images for Frank Lloyd Wright, I found that brick uh, entrance, the entrance with the brick holes and some glass rocks sitting with a light behind. And I right away knew that's Quest Squeed and right there. But it's been said so much about Frank Lloyd Wright that it's almost impossible to say something new about this guy. Uh, everything has to be said about him. It's been said. So it's... <laughs> When it came time to find a subject, I thought, boy, I'm not the guy who knows history of this person, uh, but I know coming to this country, hardly knowing Frank Lloyd Wright, when I came, I guess the only work I had seen being a student in India was probably Falling Water, of course, and some work here and there, and, and my, my recollection is I found the work way too ornamental, the young I am, and I was impressed being in India with the work of Carbusier and Louis Kahn. Frank Lloyd Wright just seemed like he was old fashioned. More I know now, uh, I know what this guy stands for. Here we go. I, when the Guggenheim was done in New York City, it was a happening thing. Uh, it was a controversial thing. Uh, a lot of people hated it. The people who got it understood that it was a very, very creative way to do a museum. Uh, concrete, ramps, um, he was doing things which were unheard of uh, when it comes to the language of a museum. Now we live in a world where Guggenheim, this is what the new Guggenheim is. Uh, Frank Gehry does this Guggenheim and changes, uh, gives a brand new vocabulary to what I call the museum should be. Um, this building done for $155,000, we think it's the greatest building, creative building, and just a few years ago in my city, Mumbai, somebody spent a billion dollars to put a single family house of this size. Frank Lloyd Wright somehow survives. Um, he did a long building. I have been to this building, I cannot believe how big this building is in California. And I thought, when we think this is big, Stephen Hall puts a building which is taller or longer than a Chrysler building horizontally. He elevates it from the ground so he ends up with more gardens between the ground he saves and the roof he creates than what he starts with. 1,296,000 square feet house. Frank Lloyd Wright isn't the biggest or structurally too when, when this building was built people couldn't believe it how crazy this building was, how creative this building was, and look what happens to a museum nowadays. It's structurally compli complicated, um, visually stunning. Kalatrava is just breaking rules over and over again. When, when you see the architecture today, between the technology we have and the labor we have, the buildings are getting more and more complicated, 
you know, in this building, the Illinois proposed by Franklin Wright in Chicago, that was a landmark. I mean, it was not even a real building, but it was something to be seen even as a rendering. And now we have Burj Khalifa standing, which is not obviously one mile high, but it's half a mile high. And you wonder why Franklin Wright, everybody still talks about Franklin Wright today. And the reason to me comes down to these three main things. Uh, it's the work which speaks to everybody. Uh, the students, it's exceptional students he had. He kind of kept his legacy going, his language going, and people like us who see at Franklin Wright and think, not only me, graphic artist, but jewelry designer, fabric designer, constantly see the complexity and yet simplicity of Franklin Wright's work and try to do something with it. We'll start with work. Um, when I use the word work, I was thinking, should I say life? And I read about his life, his life was very controversial, but his work was never controversial yet. It was so solid and it was so visionary. So <laughs> what I'm trying to say is work is the right way to say Franklin Wright, because if you say life, it has a lot of different meaning which is attached uh, to his controversial life, uh, the personal life. Today's architecture, you know, we all know, uh, changing temperatures, global warming, um, everybody is worried about what this building does to our, our planet Earth today. And the one thing which has happened to architecture is what we call LEED. LEED is a certification program which is developed in a, with an idea that building instead of damaging the planet Earth should somehow help to make the life richer. And if you really think about it, it's such an old concept which Frank Lloyd Wright talked about 100 years ago, nothing new about it. Yet, to be certified, to certify your building as a lead project, you have to meet certain goals, you know, uh, certain standards in water conservancy, uh, how much energy you use, the, does, is it innovative, does it, does it really do justice to the site or the environment or the <laughs> ecosystem. And a good example to sort of start seeing frankly right what how he matters or what he did 100 years ago what people are still doing same thing under the name of lead which is the current the most current thing what all the architects are trying to meet so let's start with understanding what sustainable site means the the lead says promote strategies that minimize the impact of ecosystem and water resources so let's see what one example was Mr. Wright did with a very known example. He takes a fairly large, well, it's not a large in today's term, but a pretty ambitious project on a river. Mr. Wright comes with an answer of this open plan over the water. Everybody knows it overhangs on the water, but very few people really get it. That the first floor, one big open sea place, look how small the kitchen is in today's standard, but he's smart. He takes the second floor and overhangs on every corner. The blue print is what the second floor is. If you see the footprint of the first floor and see the second floor, he's overhanging in every direction. But if you go to the foundation, that black area is the only part of the building which touches the site. That means minimum disturbance to the existing site. Minimum water flow is just the way it used to be. He touches the ground very carefully understanding that we are right next to the river and more I get around or on river, he's gonna deal with structural issues. But uh, what a s clever idea to have, what 20% of the footprint is on the ground and rest of the footprint is overhanging above. Very smart way to meet what I call site sensitivity. Another thing you notice, and I notice obviously, the houses he does in Wisconsin obviously looks different than the houses he does in Arizona, the houses he do, well, what he did in California. The word today, in which I love this word, in which I try to practice, is regionalism. Um, there, is a, there is a reason why houses in India, or traditional houses in India, looked different than houses probably uh, in Canada or houses in Australia. The smart indigenous architecture usually was created with wisdom of two or 3,000 or 5,000 years understanding what the weather patterns are. And the architecture developed slowly but solidly understanding how it breathes, how it deals with humidity, how it deals with heat, cold of that particular area. And frankly, right, 
sort of got it. If you see Wisconsin architecture and you see Taliesin West, which is Arizona, you right away see there's something different about it. The colors are obviously very West. The construction methods, stones, everything is indigenous. And indigenous means typically it's cheaper to build, of course, because the labor people, the available labor knows how to use the stone in this place a lot better than anywhere else. There is a reason in Mexico you will find plastered walls a lot more, even today, often, than a drywall. Drywall is more expensive way to do things in India today. Plaster, everybody knows. You can grab any guy who is a mason on the road. They know how to do plaster work. In this country, we are starting to pay $4 per square foot for plaster just because drywall is so easy to do, who wants to make money doing plaster? Frank Ware Wright really knew that, that you know, if you use indigenous methods of construction, you're gonna get construction costs under control. Um, and more than that, the house is gonna sing with seasons and sing with life or the planet Earth a lot better. These are quick sketches um, giving you an idea like this one Long shadow, long verandas, or long trellis work will give you protect the house or the inner core of the building from sun, which is usually the problem in West. He had very clever ways to get hot air out from the upper windows. He had cross ventilation, cold air coming from bottom and hot air escaping from the top. He had sort of a cool duct, which are literally nothing but holes in the ground coming from outside, grabbing the cold air in and the hot air escaping from these chimneys in West. Clever ideas, but today people have to get points for it. There were no point system for Frank Miller Wright. <laughs> he did it because he knew that was a smart thing to do, and that's the only way what he considered to be God, which is nature, to protect his God, which was nature. And the, the second part which LEAD really promotes is to use local materials or local resources. In my office, we do houses, we don't have to do any LEED certification. What I call to people, we do sustainability or all these things as common sense. And part of that common sense doing houses, it's impossible. For me, it comes via this kind of guy who, who nailed it for years and years, told everybody that to do a house, to do an architecture, to be successful in doing architecture, you have you have to respect planet Earth. So everything he did, so material and resources, how did Mr. Wright do it? Natural light, boy, you go to Quest Quinton, the house we're gonna write around here, or Johnson Wax, he knew how to get light. Um, and he didn't just get the light in, he took the opportunity to get the light in and made it beautiful too. Uh, to get light in, you just need a window, but you need Franklin Wright to get a light like this inside the house. And you see this example repeating over and over. Why did he do stained glass? Of course, it's pretty. It also was his way to break. Uh, these are very clear. But a lot of the Roby House and other stained glasses you see, there is, you know, lead lattice work and darker <laughs> color glasses, reducing the amount of sunlight coming in, creating patterns. He made things beautiful yet functional. You see this one. Wisconsin, if I'm correct, um, he uses glass, frosted glass, to get the light inside the house. I mean, inside the house of God. But he knew how to use light, and he doesn't leave light just alone. He puts another structure in between, so that when the light travels from top to bottom, it's de doing more than just a functional part of the light. He's trying to create a spirit which is higher than just the function. A Usonian house, that's what all he did. He did radiant floors to be efficient for people to feel better. He put clear story windows to bring indirect light when the overhangs were protecting those clear story. He gave these southern windows when the suns were lower in sub, in winter, we'll get sunlight inside. Um, he just knew what he was doing. He goes to California and comes up with this brilliant idea of a concrete block, which he called a textile block. But he digs the dirt and gravel right from the site. These things were poured right on the site. He didn't even go somewhere on a quarry to do it. He just said, if I'm gonna dig a foundation, I'm gonna use all the dirt and make something out of it. And he called it, house belonged to the ground on which it stood. Did, well, Chime in anytime you know more than me, and that will be a lot of times, that will be true. Um, 
I mean, this is this is again. This is um, Florida, uh, where the light is in abundance. Uh, he wants the light to come in, but not through a big window. And in uh, Florida, the campus he did, you will find a lot of concrete blocks embedded with this thick layer of glass. The light comes in, but not bright. We are really fighting heat over there. We want light, but not the heat. And he's buying. This is Talies and West, where where he does the form work with stones put in. Another thing which people talk about is material and resources, promote better building energy performance through innovative strategies. And when it comes to innovation, Frank Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright had enough of it, a lot of it. Uh, when people are we're talking about diffuse light, um, how to disperse light, instead of a sunlight coming in, you get this diffused indirect light. He goes ahead and puts this corning tubes. Um, not, I don't know how many people know, but this building just opened up last year. Now you can go and visit this building. I have never seen this building in person. Um, that's one thing to visit. It's amazing. I was reading about it and I found out just for curiosity, this building was not allowed to be in because Frank Lloyd Wright put a spiral staircase as the only source to go up and up, up and down, which was 30 inch wide. That's it. So I would suspect that to meet the new fire codes, they probably had to put a new staircase in. But that's an amazing building. Uh, he did these, this is a Jacob's second Usonian to be precise, because they did one in Wisconsin for them. But he came across these circular buildings as in the search of the path of sun, which is a circle, and he puts these houses facing south so it catches sun from east to west, yet protecting the northern side of the house and putting berms or earth on that side so it's always cooler, sort of a passive way to cool and heat the house. And, and it really works. Uh, this is in Madison, Wisconsin. But look at what he says. A berm type dwelling on an exposed hilltop site, excavated on a sunken cycle in front of the hand cycle facing, the south furnishes the earth, earth bank surrounding the building to be north. Basically, he's protecting the cold side and north side and opening up the windows on south side for kids to play. What a simple idea. I don't even know. It's just such a common sense that today, the common sense is gone that you have to have a LEED certification program to tell somebody that you should be doing this to make a building <laughs> better. It just seems stupidity that architects who go to school for seven, eight years have to have this to be told on a paper by government that you gotta do this. And Franklin Wright did it because he knew that's the way to be close to God. Uh, you know, this is one thing which is so big today for us, and you will know why. We only have less than 1% of water on this earth, which is available to us to drink. And average family, American family, I should say American, because every time I go in India, my best thing I do is I take a three, three or two gallon bucket and I take my whole bag in three, three gallons. And I feel like, why did we ever invent this shower which uses 30 gallons? I would tell my kids, those are Americans, and I would tell them, stop, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 gallons you have spent. But look at this, 400 gallons of water in a day, average family uses, and 70% of that water is indoor, and 27% of it is just in a toilet. Water closet uses 27% of the water we use. Mr. Wright, when he did all this, we really didn't face water issues at that point. And he was smart, when he went to West, look at the landscape he does. He just puts a rock and he lets everything be. He doesn't have a lawn which you have to fertilize. He doesn't have some perennials growing in, in West. Yet, if you go to Wisconsin, where perennials just grow like weeds, he has it all over. He's very smart. Falling water, it's impossible to say where the landscape ends, the natural landscape starts, and where the artificial begins. There is no line between nat nature and what he did. He was that seamless. Not that that was an issue at that point, but he, the guy is always smart. If he found the site where water was draining, he made a pond out of it so the water would collect. And today, what do we do? We put terrace gardens with plants on it. So if it in case rains, all the water doesn't drain out from the gutter on the streets and flood the streets. He was just smart. 
Another thing, innovation has points in lead. Architect and innovation, isn't that something what architects should just do? But we get points now for innovating things. And this guy, the problem was he innovated way too much. He was always fighting innovating things. This column would take care of the building. Nobody believes him. He has to make one, put tons of weight to prove it will work. But he takes ideas. Who would think this is inspiration for this? But he was innovative. He takes the Midwest architecture, we should see how it looked at during that point. And look what he did to Midwest architecture. He comes up with Roby House. He comes up with a museum idea and puts a ramp through it. And when artists told that, oh, between the crooked floor and straight walls, it's, the paintings are never gonna look good. And he said, well, then you will learn how to paint better. <laughs> <laughs> he was arrogant, but he was confident. And I tell even my kids, my interns, that there's a thin line between arrogance and confidence. If you know what you are doing, it's confidence. When you think you know everything, that's arrogance. <laughs> this guy proved it. And, and actually, I have gone to this place so many times, and now, all these areas which he created structurally becomes a great place to put one piece of art. Uh, very innovative. Look at the amount of objects this guy creates. Every house, everything he does, he thinks, we're gonna design this. <coughs> he, he doesn't know any boundaries. Uh, that's what I love about architects or my own field, that's why I'm an architect. We have been told, you can do everything. That's what makes us arrogant. Um, I have, that's why you will find in Europe, more so in the United States, architects design motorbikes, they design uh, industrial materials. Uh, look at Frank Gehry, what he's doing. He's doing Eisenhower Memorial on Washington. He's looking in search for some metal fabric. He doesn't find the one he wants. He literally buys an expensive fabric producing machine and designs the fabric in-house. He's producing metal fabric in his office. He just figured if nobody's doing it, I'm gonna do it myself. But that's a typical architect spirit. They, they think if they try, they're gonna do it. <laughs> the next part, I think it's so important to talk about what he did with students. Um, uh, I love this. Um, he was not politically correct. That's what makes him interesting. Um, we worry so much, especially when pe people are, I'm always worried I'll, I'll talk too much and somebody's gonna put it on Facebook right now. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another thing to think about innovation for this guy. If this guy lived in today's time, just think about how many followers this guy will have it on Facebook or Twitter. <laughs> the guy knew how to use media. Uh, the, he knew how to get published. He knew what to say when he's talking on interviews. He knew how to bend the media to get new clients or to be in limelight. That's something to learn. Uh, he knew uh, that media is the way architects get famous and he knew how to use it. John Lutner, he died recently, but it's amazing. Lutner, who was in Taliesin, the kind of architecture he has done in LA. You have seen most of these buildings in movies. Um, he, the LA is full of Lutner's houses. And this is um, Hope's, um, the, comedian hopes, $50 million house. Uh, I, I got so happy that he know, not only he knew how to make a joke, he had perfect uh, education in architecture to like something like this. He was, now I think after seeing this house, it's him. I think he was really smart. Uh, uh, look at this. I don't know whether you guys have seen all these houses in movies or not, but they're over and over again in a lot of the movies you see. Paulo Soleri, he took what Frank Lloyd Wright talked about you know, how to be nice to earth. And he thought what Frank Lloyd Wright did was too small of a proportion. He wanted to create, look at this, the scale of a Chrysler building and look what this building is. I always say in, in historical terms, in modern architecture, 20th century, these guys really shaped up what we are. And this guy stands, you know, Carbusier, not many buildings in uh, United States, but Mies, you know, he's learned a lot from Corbu and Corbu did a lot of things during his time everywhere and affected what architecture is today in America. Louis Sullivan, of course, you know, he threw the seats to this guy. And Louis Kahn, um, he's one of my favorite. And so is he, but this guy, again, I, I grew up thinking this guy was God. And I think Louis Kahn, I wish he had more time in his life to create more buildings in the United States. Look at these guys. These guys were
were not mainstream thinkers and you know we think jobs is a visionary today look what this guy is control freak god learn from this guy uh, you think Steve Jobs is control freak? <laughs> this is really important i've learned this you know Carl Sagan to me is very important in my life. I think he, the way he talked about astronomy, nobody else did. And the way he did it, one, he was, he loved it. And every time he talked about astronomy, it oozed out of him. You knew when he said billions and billions of miles. <laughs> he knew, you just knew that Carl Sagan represented relationships of human beings to astronomy. He went beyond what astronomy would be. Look at her loaf of butter. Every time you think about French cuisine or great food, you cannot ignore what Julia Child did. She made butter fashionable. <laughs> Mr. Ali, a small guy, small career, but he speaks of sports and sportsmanship more than anybody else. Maya Angelou, I was just telling somebody, poem, God, poem is so hard to squeeze a whole. I say, if I was going to write anything, I would write a novel. Poem is hard. <laughs> and look at it. The way, the way, the, the passion and the love she spoke of poem, I don't think anybody would speak for poem and anybody would have patience to listen, but she did. Kids listen. I mean, Frank would write to me was about architecture. He was so passionate. He was so smart. He represented not only his work, he spoke about architecture passionately and made architecture one of those things. That's what <laughs> made, I think, the architect school. All his work made, it, made us important, made us significant in urban fabric uh, or profession as a profession. Nobody did to profession what this guy did. How many people really know Frank Gehry? Or I would say Kulha. People don't know that many architects, but everybody knows Mr. Wright. Um, and this is what I think, you know, my introduction to United States, thanks to National Geographic, when I thought about America, I waited for every month. I opened that first page and looked at the Canon camera lenses and I wish, you know, someday I would have Canon cameras. <laughs> but I, I looked at Yellowstone and I thought that was America. These are some things which I came to this country, I thought this was America. Albert Hitchcock was America. Woody Allen to me, who makes movies more American than Woody Allen? Simpsons, half of the non-Americans would not even get a jokes. <laughs> this is as American. And Mr. Wright, I think the success of Mr. Wright is not good architecture. He did something like Superman. He made architecture so American. Not This architecture cannot fit in India. He made contextually architecture which belonged to America, nowhere else. You know, that's what makes Mr. Wright current today. Franklin Wright, I don't think, he's part of history like Lincoln. Every time people will talk about glory days of America or architecture of America, there is no way you can ignore this guy. That's why he is affecting our century as much as he affected it in his own century. <laughs>
Cook was driving around in Iowa back uh, visiting his family in Independence and uh, bumped into a nine-year-old boy who turned out to be the electrical contractor years later for uh, Cedar Rock. So this all ties together. Roy encouraged uh, this man, James T. Martin Sr., to write uh, a short memoir of his work with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, and it has been written up as uh, Learning the Right Way, which you can read this at the Rod Library in uh, Cedar Falls. Something Roy would never tell you, but I'm going to tell you. Uh, Communications Art Magazine cited him as one of the most original thinkers in design, and uh, in the year 2003, the Smithsonian Institution's National Design Awards Committee uh, agreed with this uh, and accepted him as a uh, nominee. Hang on to your seats. Here is uh, Roy Behrens. Uh, I, I just want to preface this by telling you that I brought in uh, things not for sale. Uh, they're from my personal collection, but uh, they consists primarily of a set of what are called the Froebel kindergarten blocks, which if you know about Frank Lloyd Wright, you know that he asserted many times that he was influenced by the, that his mother had uh, obtained him when he was a child. It's, they're still being made. They're very pricey, uh, but I happen to uh, buy them because we're in this. And then the other thing is that if you want to know more about Froebel and his influence on uh, uh, other architects and designers and artists, there's this excellent, excellent book called Inventing Kindergarten, and uh, it's really worth it. And there are many, many books about Wright, more and more coming out every day, but uh, perhaps the one that I think I've learned most from is this one by Kevin Newt, N-U-T-E, called uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and Japan. Uh, and it's especially addressed to some of the issues of design, which of course is my background. Um, I'm not an architect. Uh, I come from an art and art education background, but um, now I teach graphic design and I've been practicing graphic design for a long time. Um, and in, in, in uh, particular, I, I teach a course called The History of Design. And Jerry, as Jerry indicated, uh, it includes graphic, industrial, and architectural design. So it's uh, fairly superficial because it's one semester. But I restrict it to uh, Europe and the US since uh, 1850 or thereabouts. And um, I guess I should also say that I feel uh, somewhat displaced at times. Uh, I'm in an art department at the University of Northern Iowa. Um, but I teach graphic design. And as you go around the country, very often you find that graphic design programs are not in the art department. Uh, they're in an architectural or uh, a more generic based uh, design program. So I've grown up uh, uh, to think that um, maybe as a graphic designer I don't strictly belong in the category of art uh, no, and nor do I belong in the category of architecture. I don't have those kinds of skills or understanding. Um, but I do share some of the same things back and forth. I teach in this building. It's in Cedar Falls. It's on the campus there. It was designed in 1985 uh, by a Des Moines architect. Um, and I enjoy teaching here because I think it uh, complements my, uh, the kinds of things that I talk about in relation to design when I talk to students. It's the Camerick Art Building. Um, and when I first saw it, I first saw it in 1990 when I was brought back to talk, to speak. And I walked around it. I had never seen it before. I think it was, well, 1985. And uh, I began to notice something. I began to notice um, a kind of logo or a kind of symbolic plan that I found throughout the building. And you can see it here on the right. Uh, and it looks very much like a, an arrangement of dominoes or domino proportions. Uh, and I recognized what it was or what it seemed to be. And I thought that it was uh, an arrangement of uh, derived from Japanese uh, floor plans, which uh, traditionally were composed by combining uh, tatami sleeping mats. And I think that the, the standard size of those, it could be wrong, is about uh, f three by six or something like that. It's, it's uh, two by one. And they also used uh, half tatamis, and so they could determine the arrangement of the floor, the size of the floor, the proportion of it, by 
putting together, linking together these modules of tatamis. Well, one of the things that I soon noticed is that as you walked around the building, both inside and outside, there was this same um, set of components that were built into, embedded in the features of the building, whether structural or, or surface. Um, so just to show you a little bit more of that, th this is, these are some photographs relating to tatamis. In the bottom, you can, you can see uh, an older photograph, 19th century photograph of a Japanese craftsman actually making tatami mats. And then in the top, you can see um, a Japanese, the, the floor of a Japanese house in which uh, there is an arrangement of tatami mats to determine the floor plan. If you go around the building of this building in which I teach design, um, it's very interesting to talk to my students about this motif, which keeps repeating itself. So that if you go to the auditorium, you find it on the wall and step back. This is a desk that they have. And there you find the same motif. And then, of course, in the windows. And it's not strict in any way of the uh, in any, any sense, but it, but it is uh, sort of evident around the, uh, around the building. Uh, one, one of the things that I teach is page layout and book design and um, more generally the use of uh, typographic uh, components in relation to uh, photographic uh, images and uh, also uh, more generic shapes. And in my beginning class, in order to acquaint my students with those kinds of issues, which in many cases they haven't thought about very much before, I actually have them begin with an existing advertisement, um, which has been designed by a professional designer. And I ask them to look closely at it, to study, to study the typography, to study the, the uh, shapes, and the, to study the, the colors, uh, uh, samples that, are, that, are, that they find from those, and, and then to try to talk about um, what the logic of its construction is. And in so doing, I, I asked them to build a diagram showing, uh, for example, recurrences of shapes, very much like the shapes that recur in the, in the art building. And I um, asked them to pull out the, uh, the color swatches from the particular ad. And you can see that in this particular person, or in this particular one, this person has pulled out ellipses, which uh, in some cases become the uh, bowls or they become the palette, uh, which the person is holding up, uh, and so forth. Um, I want them to know about this because as we saw, I think, in Sanjay's talk, um, it is uh, a kind of uh, characteristic of compositions and those are the kinds of things that we as graphic designers depend on a lot. And I think we share them with architects. For example, this is a, an Art Deco poster from the 1930s by a very famous poster designer, Cassandra. And you can see what he's doing. He's chosen a typeface, which has a perfectly circular O. And then that sort of uh, determines that he's going to use the O or the dot as one of the motifs in this. And, and then he's also using edge alignment. So he takes the back of the end, he comes down here, he drops it, and then he picks it up again on the interior of the ear, the back of the neck. He comes over here, he does the same thing coming down here. So it's, he's making it easy for us, or easier, or likely, that we will connect those things and we'll see the top as belonging to other components and so forth. He does the same thing going across, if you can see, on the eyebrow, on the top of the ear, the bottom of the ear, and the bottom of the nose. Uh, he even brings in the circle to some extent in the uh, use of the portion of, um, you know, of a circle for the, for the, uh, the, the, the jaw. Well, this is occurring everywhere, and we talk about it, and, and we watch for it everywhere, because sometimes it's a terribly important decider in determining the quality of the end result. These are three logos that you're, all, you're familiar with. They're logos by Paul Rand, and who at one time, before his death, was probably the best-known graphic designers in, designer in this country. And he designed a logo for the Westinghouse, and one of the things we admire is the fact that 
as if he were writing a poem. <laughs> he did this in such a brief way, in such an economical way. He's usually using only circles, and he has three circles here. He has another three up here, and he's using lines. And then he comes in here, and for that bottom line, he ha it is a line, but it also has curved edges, so it becomes in in indicative of the circle as well. The ABC logo is widely <coughs> admired, and pretty much for the same reason, because it is so economical and says so much so powerfully with such very little effort. And then here his logo for, for Yale University. You know, I have uh, been showing for the last few years a, a film, which maybe you've seen. It's, it's on some of the video rental places, called Helvetica. And Helvetica is a very powerful, widely used um, Swiss-based, um, sans-serif typeface, which is all over the place. And the film is about the evolution of that font and its uh, wide distribution. And they interview Matthew Carter, who is one of the most uh, accomplished type designers of our time. And he said something very interesting. He was trying to talk about how you begin to design a, design a typeface. He said, well, what you should do is start with about three or four letters. And he gave what the letters were. And he said, well, if you, if you design first these four letters, you will have pretty much the DNA of this font. I think that you can understand that, and you can understand how that might be compared to, let's say, the quote unquote DNA uh, of a right building, where he starts out with certain uh, attributes and then they, they flow through the entire structure and uh, really help to hold it together. He did the same, right, did the same with dinnerware sets, and it's not hypothetical because he actually did design dinnerware sets. This is one of them, but in the same way as we were talking about typefaces, the cup has a very, very different function from the plate or from the saucer, and uh, what he has to do is to nevertheless make certain that in terms of the way they're shaped, uh, the actual components, but, but also the, the surface design, that it maintains that same DNA and that they all belong together as a set. He did this in some of the most astonishing ways, and he talked about it a little bit. Um, he talked about, for example, when he would decide on a site for a particular building, this happens to be the Roby House, that he would often look at the plants that were in that particular natural setting, <coughs> And he would abstract um, a motif from those plants. So that's what he's done over here. And then that motif begins to appear, for example, in the stained glass windows. And it helps to hold the thing together, gives it a logic. Here it is again in a different form. And then, in, in the most peculiar way, he uses what Corbusier called regulating lines. We call them, designers call them grid lines. And they are connecting points of intersection and what he's able to do then is to actually embed that same pattern, that same abstraction in the, uh, in the entirety of the building itself. Well, he talked about this, um, about finding motifs, developing motifs, and then making them appear recurrently throughout the building to make them hold together. He had a name for that. He called it organic form. Uh, you can think of it as an organic integrity. Uh, and uh, to my understanding, uh, what he meant, and I take this in part from some of the statements that he's made, but other people as well, is that parts of a building should have a kind of functional duality. And he was comparing it to, for example, the functional duality of parts of the body, the thumb just like the cup in the dinnerware set, the thumb has a very, very different function than uh, the wrist or the foot. And uh, yet, at the same time, while it's an individual and it has its individual characteristics and purpose, it is also part of a larger whole and it functions uh, concurrently or in, in accordance with that larger whole. Uh, 
other people have gone further. This is not a, a rare or uncommon theory. And they've talked about um, not just the parts of the body, but words in a sentence or individuals in a society. That each one should function as a whole, a discrete entity, while at the same time contributing, contributing to a larger context. Edgar Teffel, who was one of Wright's students and had written quite a bit about him, um, talked about the Martin House. That's what we're seeing right here. And he said in designing the Martin House, he used one kind of brick outside. So he used the same brick on the inside. And in keeping with the grammar, Wright talked about the grammar of a building, the tile on the floor of the exterior porch was the same as the tile on the floor inside. He used only one kind of plaster and only one kind of wood, oak. The chairs and tables were oak, and so was, was all the wood, so was all the wood trim. Now, I don't know if Wright invented or coined the word, the, the phrase organic form. I, I, I'm sure I could find out, but I do know that that approach to architecture as well as to other things did not originate with him. It actually preceded him. And to some extent, it came out of Europe, or it was very popular in Europe, at the end of the 19th century, the turn of the century. And it came in part because of um, people's interest in William Morris, the founder of the arts and crafts movement, and his uh, uh, construction of Red House, which, which was his own home and which later then prompted Morris to design his own wallpaper for the home, his furniture, uh, and other kinds of components that were part of the inside of the house, even though him, he himself did not design the, the structure of the house. Now, two of the architects who were most famously influenced by that idea were Henry van de Velde and Peter Behrens. And, uh, they had initially started out as artists. They were going to be painters. And at some point, they felt that they would feel more gratified if they, they contributed more directly toward society and toward functional applications of what they knew. And so instead, they became architects, largely self-taught uh, self architects. And they, the both of them, designed their own homes. And not only that, but they designed all the components within their homes. The wallpaper, the furniture, the carpeting, the dinnerware, the light fixtures, and so on. Something that now we, uh, we attribute to Frank Lloyd Wright, but it was really a wider practice. What was it called in Europe? Well, it was called by uh, a rather bothersome German term, which comes from combining three German words. It was called a Gesamtkunstwerk. And if you translate it, it means total work of art. In other words, you shouldn't do just a piece of something or one component in something. If you're going to design a house, then you should do all of the things. Everything in it should be um, consistent with its wider definition and character as, as a work of art. And you can still see these homes. They're still there. They survived the, the wars. And there is Vandeville's home at the top. And then you have Peter Barron's home at the bottom. So it's, again, like, like the DNA of the font, the building has these features and this flavor uh, even though each room is different and has a different function, it has this flavor which, um, which runs throughout. This is Peter Barron's uh, dinnerware set for Barron's house. And uh, that's what you see on the left. And then on the right, you can see how he himself evolved because he had come out of Art Nouveau. And an earlier plate from an earlier dinnerware set is shown there, the blue one on the right. Now, they were made fun of. We make fun of right, uh, and, and, and understandably so, because I can't imagine if Cedar Rock had been designed for me, and then I had to live there for the rest of my life, and I couldn't put up my favorite things on the walls. 
uh, or I couldn't move things, or I couldn't bring in my own things that I really feel very personal about. <coughs> right is, is often questioned about that. And, and I think, as I said, understandably. But Henry Vanderville, especially, went even further. And he did the same thing uh, for himself and his family, but also for his clients. And this is a gown that he designed for his wife to wear in the house uh, at parties, various parties. And then down below in that little blue picture are his entire family, his kids, his wife, and they're all dressed in clothing that he designed for them to wear in the house. Yeah. Now, I don't know if when they went outside the house whether they got to wear other things or not. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, we often think, oh, heavens, yes, those Europeans, they all came over here, the flood of influence and changed American architecture. But it's interesting to find that Wright had really quite a substantial influence going the other way. Uh, because for one reason, in 1907, three of the young architects who were working in Barron's office um, Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, and Le Corbusier, they all saw um, an album of Wright's architectural work, and they became very interested. And uh, as you may or may not know, two of them, Gropius and Mies, would later become uh, directors of the Bauhaus, which, as you probably know, is the most influential art and design school in history. I think one of the clues to Wright's capabilities and his, uh, was that he saw in a certain way, and I would tend to say that he saw abstractly. Now, he didn't call it that. He said that he saw constructive patterns instead of specifically nameable things. And if you never got to that point, and many, many people never do, um, you came out of the course and you still didn't know how to draw. And, uh, so you had to come to that. Nathan Goldstein, who wrote one of the best books on drawing, textbooks on drawing, he says in there, it's a very interesting statement, he says, now isn't it ironic that in order to draw realistically, we have to see abstractly? Yeah. And the other thing I, I think of is that you know this, what, 20, 25 years ago? Um, a woman named Betty Edwards came out with a book. This was during the split brain uh, fad or whatever it might be. And she said, she came out with a book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. And she showed in the book that she had worked with novices who had never really drawn before at all. And she gave them a blank sheet of paper. And then over here, she gave them a portrait photograph. And she asked them to try to draw that portrait photograph. And she publishes the things in the book. They look horrid. They're absolutely amateur, as we would expect them to be. And then she did something else. She gave them a new sheet of paper, and she gave them the same photograph, but she turned it upside down and said, now draw from it. And she published the results. The results are pretty amazing. Because what was happening? Well, she said it began to address a different function of the brain. You know, on the right. Well, how did Wright learn to see this way? Well, we know in part because he told us. He said that he had learned to see constructive patterns by playing with geometric wooden blocks. They're the blocks right here. These are the Froebel blocks. They were invented by a German educator, Friedrich Froebel, who invented a kind of schooling which was hands-on I'm so glad that Sanjay talked before I did because he mentioned all kinds of things that now I'm going to refer back to. He kept talking about thinking out the, outside the box. And we know that that means it's a reference to problem solving uh, and our assumption of certain restrictions that really we don't have to assume. And this is the common exercise for that. It's called the nine dot problem. And so someone gives you that and they say, well, we want you to use only four lines and they have to be continuous and they have to cross through all nine dots. How can you do it? And, and people find it very, very difficult to do it initially. And the reason is that they imagine 
that there is a boundary, a box around the dots. As soon as they think outside the box and don't assume that, then they can easily connect all of the dots with the four lines. Now, now, what I'm trying to say is that I think that that's what the Japanese did in their prints, and I think that's what Wright did uh, literally because he thought outside the box of the house or other architectural construction, and in fact, he took it further into the consideration of the, the site and in, in, in uh, the, the appropriateness of the, of the building. In, in connection with this talk, this talk coming up, I told my students about it and I asked them, my design students, I asked them to try to design each of them three posters um, in which they would celebrate not specifically Cedar Rock, though they could do that, but to celebrate the idea of an afternoon with Frank Lloyd Wright and how, what would those posters look like and so I'm going to show you some of them. We ended up with, 20, with 75, I think, but uh, I'm just going to show you a few and to give you some sense of how they then applied those same kinds of uh, construction principles to the design of, uh, of posters. Thank you so much.